Good evening everyone. Welcome to Shankar IAS Academy Hindu Newspaper Analysis for the date 16th of August 2021. These are the list of topics we are going to discuss today. We are going to start our discussion with three previous year questions. And the topics we are going to discuss are National Hydrogen Energy Mission Program, Digitization of Land Records, Collegium System, Parliamentary Privileges and a Freedom Fighter from Nagaland, Rani Gaidin Lube. We are also going to have practice prelims questions and we are also going to have a mains question. Before diving into today's newspaper analysis, let us first discuss three map based previous year questions. This is the first question. It was asked in the year 2014. The question is, Turkey is located between. Let us now look at the map. From the map, it is clear that Turkey is located between Black Sea and Mediterranean Sea. So. Option B is right. Second question. This question was also asked in the 2014 paper. What is the correct sequence of occurrence of the following cities in Southeast Asia as one proceeds from South to North? The cities given are Bangkok, Hanoi, Jakarta, Singapore. Now let us look at the map. From the map we can see that Jakarta is farthest South among the cities given. Then comes Singapore, then Bangkok and then Hanoi. So, the correct order from south to north is 3, 4, 1, 2. So, the answer is option C. Moving on to the next question. This question appeared in 2015 paper. The area known as Golan Heights sometimes appear in news in the context of events related to. That's the question. So, let's look at the map. Actually, it is located between Israel and Syria. This question was asked during the peak of Syrian civil war. See, UPSC likes to pick up places from the current affairs. So, follow the news regularly. That's all for the previous year question discussion. Now, let's move on to the newspaper analysis. Now, take a look at this article. See, yesterday we celebrated our 75th Independence Day. On this historical day, our Prime Minister announced several initiatives. This article is regarding that. So, let us discuss some of the initiatives announced by our Prime Minister. First one is Gati Shakti. What is Gati Shakti? See, Gati Shakti is a 100 lakh crore national infrastructure master plan. This master plan aims for developing a holistic infrastructure. It will result in new employment opportunities for lakhs of youth. Also, according to our Prime Minister, this master plan would raise the global profile of local manufacturers. See, one of the problems faced by our local manufacturers is the logistics cost. In the 2018 Logistics Performance Index, India occupied the 44th rank, whereas China was placed at 26th rank. This master plan will help India move up the Logistics Performance Index. And by bringing down the logistics cost, it will also aid the local manufacturers to compete worldwide. See, we are still waiting for more details and the launch date of this project. Once we get it, we will update it in the upcoming news analysis. Now, moving on to other initiatives. The next one is opening of Sainik schools for girls. See, Sainik schools are a system of schools in India established and managed by the Sainik Schools Society under the Ministry of Defense. The concept of Sainik schools was conceived by V.K. Krishna Menon in 1961. V.K. Krishna Menon was the Defense Minister of India in 1961. Why was it conceived? It was created to rectify the regional and class imbalance among the officer cadre of Indian military. These schools were also created to prepare the students mentally and physically for entry into the National Defense Academy and National Naval Academy. See, it is important to know that these Sainik schools traditionally admit only boys. They are not co-educational. But in his latest speech, our Prime Minister has decided to make Sainik schools co-educational. According to the announcement, all Sainik schools will be made co-educational by 2021-22. Moving on to the next initiative, that is National Hydrogen Energy Mission. 
See, National Hydrogen Energy Mission aims to use hydrogen as a energy source. We all know hydrogen is one of the most abundant elements on earth. Also, the energy produced from hydrogen is a clean energy. So, India is planning to tap the clean energy from hydrogen. Based on the production of hydrogen, the hydrogen can be divided into three types. They are grey hydrogen, blue hydrogen and green hydrogen. Of the three, green hydrogen is the cleanest. This is because during the production of grey and blue hydrogen, carbon dioxide is obtained as a byproduct. Whereas during the production of green hydrogen, there is no such dangerous emissions. This is because green hydrogen is produced using renewable energy like solar and wind. On the other hand, grey and blue hydrogen are produced using hydrocarbons. So, this is why India through its National Hydrogen Energy Mission is planning to focus on generation of hydrogen from green power sources. To put it in simple words, it focuses on green hydrogen. Now, let us see why this mission is significant. See, this mission has the potential to make India energy independent. India now uh, imports 80% of the energy needs from abroad. This mission has the potential to make India energy independent. Also, India through its intended national determined contribution has pledged to reduce the emission intensity of GDP by 33%. This initiative will help India achieve this target. This initiative has the potential to transform the transportation sector. India has been pushing for electric vehicles through the FAME initiative. So, National Hydrogen Mission combined with the FAME initiative will transform India's transportation sector. With this takeaway points, let us move on to the next article. Our next discussion is based on this news article which mentions about the issues with the digitized land records. The article reports that there were many errors in the digitized pattas. Pattas refer to the revenue records of a piece of land. Now, efforts are being taken to check these errors and make corrections. Here, as an aspirant, our focus should be on the scheme under which these records were digitized. So, today let us discuss the National Land Records Modernization Program that is NLRMP and Digital India Land Records Modernization Program that is DIL RMP. The syllabus is highlighted here for your reference. See, government wanted to introduce a scheme for the modernization of land records in the country. But why? To begin with, government of India wanted to modernize the management of land records in the country. In addition, the government wanted to minimize the scope of land or property disputes. Furthermore, the government wanted to enhance transparency in the land records maintenance system and more importantly it wanted to facilitate a nudge towards the guaranteed conclusive titles to immovable properties in the country see here first you need to understand the difference between presumptive title and conclusive title presumptive title was the system which was practiced before in that the ownership is guaranteed based on a registered sale deal this sale deed is a record of the property transaction between a buyer and the seller. Additionally, certain other documents were also mandatory for such transaction, that is, for selling or buying. These other documents include the record of rights, property tax receipts and survey documents. But the issue was that all these documents were only a record of transfer of property and they are not government guaranteed title to the property. That means the buyer was not privy to the previous ownership record of the property and therefore the record could be challenged in court. This is why the system is called presumptive one. But if we take the conclusive title or the conclusive titling system, here the government provides guaranteed titles and compensation in case of any ownership dispute. So, here the government holds the responsibility. But to move to a conclusive titling system, many upgradations were required, such as 
shifting to a system of registered property titles as opposed to sale deeds clear and updated land records etc note that these registered property titles will be the primary evidence of ownership for this purpose national land records modernization program was launched in 2008 it was a centrally sponsored scheme here note from the exam perspective that land and its management is a state subject under 7th schedule of the constitution so it is under the legislative and administrative jurisdiction of the state government national land records modernization program was actually launched by merging two centrally sponsored schemes they are computerization of land record scheme and strengthening of revenue administration and updating of land record scheme its main objective was to develop a modern comprehensive and transparent land records management system in the country and also to implement the conclusive land titling system with title guarantee so remember the ultimate goal of national land records modernization program was to replace the existing presumptive title system in the country and to usher in to the conclusive titling system with title guarantee these objectives were based on four basic principle which is given here for your reference next these were the components of national land records modernization program the main components include computerization of all land records and digitization of maps the other components are attached here please go through it but as time went by and india progressed to digitization under digital india this national land records modernization program was also revamped in 2016 under the digital india initiative it has been revamped as digital india land records modernization program this revamped scheme is a central sector scheme note the difference the old one was central sponsored scheme this is a central sector scheme this means it has 100% central funding its objective has three parts first to build upon the commonalities that exist in the arena of land records in various states second to develop an appropriate integrated land information management system that is ILIMS across the country through ILIMS the aim is to ensure the availability of all the information at one place third to facilitate different states to add state specific needs so what are the major components of this scheme first it is computerization of land records then survey resurvey and updating of the survey and settlement records then computerization of registration then establishing modern record rooms land record management centers at different levels that is tehsil taluk circle and block level then training and capacity building lastly core geospatial information system that is gis finally certain benefits of the scheme are discussed here they are it provides easy access to computerized copy of record of rights and other land based certificates such as domicile certificates it provides guaranteed and integrated public services it also enables reduced interface with the government office thereby reducing the chance of bribery now we have come to the end of this discussion let us move to the next discussion now let's take up this news article about the judicial vacancies in india according to the news article judicial appointments to the supreme court have remained frozen since 2019 Similarly even the judicial strength is found to fade in 25 high courts so on this line recently supreme court bench accused the center for delaying to act on the recommendations of the collegium and appoint judges to the high courts and it also asserted that this uncooperative attitude of the government is affecting the adjudication of important cases especially those with high stake commercial issues so this is the crux of this news article now based on this context we are going to have a basic understanding about the judicial appointments and the collegium system in india the syllabus covered by this article is highlighted below for your reference article 124 class 2 
and article 217 class 1 of the constitution deals with the appointment to the higher judiciary that is the supreme court and the high court article 124 class 2 says every judge of the supreme court is appointed by the president by the warrant under his hand and seal after consultation with such judges of the supreme court and high court of the state as the president may deem necessary now let us see what warrant under his hand and seal means see when the constitution mentions warrant under hand and seal the president cannot delegate the power to another authority whereas when it is just mentioned as appointed by the president the president may delegate the power to another authority of his choice article 217 class 1 deals with the appointment of the judges of high court here the judges are appointed by the president by the warrant under his hand and seal after consultation with the chief justice of india governor of the state and in case of the appointment of the judges other than the chief justice the chief justice of the concerned high court is also consulted i have attached the articles for your reference please do look into it know that in india we follow the collegium system when it comes to the appointment to the higher judiciary and have in mind this collegium system evolved through the judgments of the high court and not by any act of parliament or by a provision of constitution before moving further let's have an idea on the evolution of this collegium system see the roots of the collegium system can be traced back to a series of supreme court judges called the judges case this is because the present collegium system came into existence through the interpretations of relevant constitutional provisions by the supreme court in these judges case now let's have a quick run through on the crux of the three judges cases which paved way for the collegium system in india see until 1973 there was a consensus between the government and the supreme court when it comes to the appointment of the chief justice of india and generally the senior most judge of the supreme court will be appointed as the cji that is chief justice of india but the convention got breached in 1973 when justice a n ray was appointed as the chief justice of india and this resulted in a power tussle between the executive and the judiciary this power tussle led to the first judges case 1982 in this case the supreme court held that consultation does not mean concurrence it only implies exchange of views this gave an upper hand to the executive regarding the appointment of judges to the higher judiciary but it did not end there because in the second judges case of 1993 the supreme court overruled its earlier verdict and in that judgment the court reversed its earlier ruling and change the meaning of the word consultation to concurrence it also added that the recommendation should be made by the chief justice of india in consultation with his two senior most colleagues and this was followed by the third judges case of 1998 in this judgment it held that recommendation should be made by the chief justice of india and his four senior most colleagues it also held that even if two judges gave an adverse opinion the chief justice should not send the recommendation to the government and this judgment ultimately resulted in the present form of collegium which is in practice ever since see there are two types of collegium one is the supreme court collegium and the other one the high court collegium the difference between them lies in their composition to explain better see the supreme court collegium is headed by the chief justice of india and it comprises of four senior most judges of the court whereas a high court collegium is led by its chief justice and four other senior most judges of that court but have in mind the names recommended by the high court collegium reaches the government only after approval by the chief justice of india and the supreme court collegium and even the government has a very little role to play only after the names have been decided by the collegium for instance the government can raise its objection and seek clarification 
regarding the collegium's choices but however if the collegium reiterates the same name the government is bound under the constitution bench judgments to appoint them as judges with this basic understanding of the collegium system let's move on to the next part of our news discussion now look at this news article recently parliament has been witnessing dramatic scenes and in that regard some ministers have raised the issue with the rajya sabha chairman and submitted a video footage evidence so in this context let us first refresh the privileges that we discussed on 31st july and then we shall proceed to discuss a related concept that is contempt proceedings see each house of the indian parliament collectively and their members individually enjoy certain powers privileges and immunities these are considered essential for them to discharge their functions and duties effectively without any hindrance so basically parliamentary privileges are special rights immunities and exemptions that are enjoyed by the houses of the parliament their committees and their individual members now let us look into various sources of the privileges some are mentioned in the constitution some are specified in certain statutes some are given in the rules of procedure and conduct of business of houses now let us see the constitutional provisions which deal with these privileges first is article 105 this article provides for the powers privileges and immunities to the houses of the parliament members of the parliament and the parliamentary committees it is very important because it first ensures freedom of speech in parliament we all know parliament is a deliberative body and a lot of heated debates happen there so to create a safe space we need this provision so article 105 provides that no member of the parliament shall be liable to any proceedings in any court in respect to anything said or any vote given by her or him in the parliament or in any committee similar to article 105 which ensures that freedom of speech of the parliamentarians are protected the article 194 ensures that freedom of speech of the state legislators are protected next is article 122 this article prohibits the courts to enquire into the proceedings of the parliament so these are some of the constitutional provisions with respect to powers and privileges of the parliament and its members when any of the rights and immunities are disregarded or attacked by any individual or authority then breach of privilege is said to have occurred and this is punishable under law no pay attention normally we use breach of privilege and contempt of the house interchangeably but it is wrong because both are different contempt of the house can be defined generally as an act or omission which obstructs or impedes either house of the parliament in the performance of its functions here you have to note that not all breaches of privileges or contempt of house contempt of the house can be defined generally as any act or omission which obstructs or impedes either house of the parliament in the performance of its function here you have to note that not all breaches of privilege are contempt of the house a person may be guilty of the contempt of the house even though he does not violate any of the privileges of the house for example when any person disobeys an order to be a part of a committee it is contempt of the house but not breach of privilege so the commotion that has been caused is more likely to be dealt with as a contempt rather than breach of privilege this is all we can take away from this article with this take away points let us move on to the next article now let us take up this news article for our discussion this article is about a speech made by the governor of nagaland in his speech he paid homage to the heroes of nagaland including rani gaidinlu about whom we are going to discuss now 
As we know, several individuals across the country played an integral role in the freedom struggle against the British. Though many of the freedom fighters are well known, still there are many of them who have been lost to the records of history. And one such person is Rani Gaidinlu, popularly known as the Daughter of the Hills. See, Rani Gaidinlu is a Naga spiritual and political reader who is remembered for fighting against the British colonizers for the rights of her people. She was born on 1915 at Tamenglong district in present-day Manipur and she belongs to the Rongmai Naga tribe. See, this Rongmai Naga tribe is a major Naga tribe that is indigenous to Northeast India. And remember, this tribe is listed as a scheduled tribe under the constitution of India. Coming back, Gaidin Liu was always keen to preserve the identity and culture of her community named Zilian Grong, which is spread across Assam, Manipur and Nagaland. And you wouldn't believe it, she joined the freedom struggle in the year 1930 when she was just 13 years old. And for the next three years of her life, she dedicated her life to driving out the British from the region. And as a consequence, she met with life imprisonment at the age of 16. And she was in jail for the next 14 years. Know that she was finally released in 1947 after India's independence on our first Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru's orders. Nehru described Gaidin Liu as the daughter of the hills and he gave her the title Rani for her courage. Gaidin Liu was also at the forefront of Hareka movement which was a socio-religious movement that arose in the 1920s in Zilyangrong territory. This particular movement was originally started by her cousin to resist the infiltration of Christian missionaries as well as the changes made by the British government. Note that Gaidin Liu began her own version of non-cooperation movement among Naga tribes. And by instructing all households to abstain from paying taxes, she made it difficult for the British administration to function in that region. Also remember, Gaidin Liu was awarded with the Tamra Patra and the Padmambushan Awards. In her honour, the Indian government also released a postage stamp. These are some important points that you need to have in mind about Rani Gaidin Liu. With these facts, let's move on to the next discussion. Now, let's take up the practice prelims questions. First question. Consider the following statements. Swamitva is a centrally sponsored scheme implemented by the Ministry of Panjaiti Raj to provide an integrated property validation solution for rural India. Second statement. Unique land parcel identification number ULPAN system is a 14-digit alphanumeric unique ID to survey plots on the basis of general boundary principle. Which of the statements given above is or correct? Statement 1 is incorrect. Actually, Swamitva scheme is a central sector scheme launched by Prime Minister on National Panjaiti Day that is on 24th April 2020. The Ministry of Panjaiti Raj is the nodal ministry for the implementation of the scheme. Survey of India is the technology partner for the implementation of the scheme. This scheme aims to provide an integrated property validation solution for rural India. The demarcation of rural Abadi areas would be done using drone surveying technology. This would provide the record of rights to the village household owners possessing houses in inhabited rural areas in villages which in turn would enable them to use their property as a financial asset for taking loans and other financial benefits from bank. Statement 2 is correct because the unique land parcel identification number ULPAN system is a 14 digit alphanumeric ID for each land parcel. This is the next step in the Digital India Land Records Modernization program. The unique IDs are based on geo reference coordinates of vertices of the parcel. That means the identification will be based on the latitude and longitude of the land parcel and is dependent on the detailed survey and the geo-referenced cadastral maps. So, it is a unique ID to survey plots 
on the basis of general boundary principle it will be a single authoritative source of truth of information for any parcel of land this id would be of international standard and in compliance of the electronic commerce code management association that is eccma standard and open geospatial consortium ogc standards it provides compatibility so that all states can adopt it easily proper land statistics and land accounting through ulpin will help develop land bank and lead towards integrated land information management system so the correct option is option b that is two only is correct moving on to the next question with reference to the parliamentary privileges consider the following statements first statement it is constitutionally sanctioned second statement they are incorporated to give the legislators the freedom to deliberate third statement courts can interfere in their proceedings which of the statements given above is or are correct from the discussion we know statement 1 and statement 2 are correct we saw about article 105 article 194 from this we can know that the parliamentary privileges are constitutionally sanctioned but coming to statement 3 it is wrong because according to article 122 courts are prohibited to enquire into the proceedings so the correct answer is option b that is 1 and 2 only moving on to the next question consider the following statements first statement blue hydrogen is extracted from renewable energy sources second statement carbon dioxide is emitted as a by product during the production of gray hydrogen which of the following statement given above is or are correct statement 1 is wrong actually green hydrogen is the one that is extracted from renewable energy sources blue hydrogen is extracted from hydrocarbon sources statement 2 is right carbon dioxide is actually emitted as a by product during the production of gray hydrogen so option b is correct which is 2 only moving on to the next question now let us look at this question with reference to rani guide in lieu consider the following statement the first statement she belongs to a scheduled tribe that is indigenous to northeast india second statement she was against the naga national council which was engaged in a secessionist movement third statement the indian government has released a postage stamp in her honor which of the statements given above is or are correct as we saw in our discussion rani guide in lieu was born in tamanglong district in present day manipur and she belongs to the rongmai naga tribe which is a major naga tribe that is indigenous to northeast india and this tribe is listed as a scheduled tribe under the constitution of india so statement 1 is correct coming to the second statement see in independent india guide in lieu was against the naga national council's demand for sovereignty and independence of naga territory from india and she in fact demanded a separate zilian grang area within the union of india and she faced opposition from other naga leaders for her demand so she was forced to go underground in 1960 but however she later reached an agreement with the government of india and dismantled the underground movement so statement 2 is also correct on talking about the third statement she was awarded with tamara patra and padma bhushan in her honor the indian government also released a postage stamp so this statement is also correct since the question asks for the right statement the correct answer is d that is 1 2 1 the main question for today is displayed here please practice at home now we have come to the end of the discussion if you like this video like comment and share with your friends and please don't forget to subscribe to shankara as academy youtube channel thank you